again, you know, welcome Eric. I mean, it's great to have him. He had a great presentation before on web sockets, and he's doing great. And we're really honored to have him here again. Thank you. Uh, I can take it up. Cool. Thanks. Hi, I'm Eric. I'm the uh, <coughs> uh, manager of web applications for the global team at Mesh.com. That basically means I manage our mobile website, I now manage our Facebook integration, and we have this whole thing we're trying to get rid of, I manage that too, and I try not to think about it too much. So that's what I do. I basically work on the mobile web all of the time. Uh, but when I want to have fun, I draw stuff on Canvas. And so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this presentation. So Canvas. Has anybody used Canvas before? Raise your hand. OK, so is anybody like awesome at Canvas? Okay, cool. All right, I want to show you something. I want to show you the Canvas tag. All right, here you go. Here is your HTML5 tag. Now, and, and that's it, really, as far as your tags are concerned. There's not much to it, at least in the HTML. The API and all the, the real stuff with Canvas is all JavaScript. You put this on the page, and then you just go with JavaScript, and that's all you do with this. Now let's talk about Canvas. Now, Canvas is something you draw on, okay? Most things about HTML5, as you probably know, are not really visual. The CSS3 stuff is, that's very visual, obviously, that's CSS. But, you know, geolocation, not visible. Um, WebSockets, not visible. Canvas is all visual. It's all about drawing things. So if you want to think about Canvas like this, all right? This is a canvas, all right? If you want to draw on the canvas, you take something and you draw, and I'll show you how to draw in a second. Now, I've drawn this on my canvas. If I want to move this over there, what do I do? <laughs> okay, that doesn't work, right? I have to erase it. I have to erase it, and I have to draw it over here. Now, if you have a, an, a div on your page, on your HTML page, and you want to move it from one side of the screen to the other, and it's absolutely positioned, do you have to delete the, the div from the DOM and then move it over? No. You just change the position on it, and boom, it'll move over there. Depending on what kind of UI you're building, if you're like building Windows Forms application or a WPF application, some things you just change their position and they move. Canvas is just like this right here. or Really, a better image of this would be just like a painting. If you have a painting and you draw on the canvas and you change your mind and you want that to go somewhere else, you can't just move the paint, right? You gotta either paint over it or scrape it off and then paint it somewhere else. So, canvas is a tag right here that allows you to draw things, all right? And it's really fast and it basically works like cartoons. If you want to do animation with uh, you know, pen and paper and, and color, what do you do? Well, you draw it on one piece of paper, then you draw it on another that's slightly different and you flip between them very quickly. That's exactly how you would do animation in Canvas. That's getting a little ahead of ourselves. Let's talk about how Canvas works. So, here's our Canvas, and that's it. If you get a Canvas, let's see, let's start here. So if you've used jQuery, well, if you haven't, here's how you would get the canvas element. I have a, uh, this is looking for the canvas by the tag, and I'm going to get the first actual HTML element, not the jQuery wrapped element, just the first HTML element. And I could have used, you know, put an ID on it and just get element by ID. I get the canvas. This gives me my, my actual canvas. The next thing I need to do is get context and get 2D. Say so get context, pass in 2D. This gives me a 2D canvas. All right? The canvas is your canvas, just like in painting. The context is your paintbrush. Okay? When you want to do something to that canvas, you pick up your context and then you do things. So we're going to do practically nothing with the canvas itself at this point. First, you get the context, and then you use that to draw. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, are you guys familiar with JavaScript? Yeah. Raise your hand if you do a lot of JavaScript. 
Okay, good. We're doing a lot of JavaScript today. So let's just get the basic ideas of what's going on right here. I'm getting my canvas and then I'm getting my context. So I'll use canvas a little bit, but mostly it's just going to be this guy right here. Okay? I've got a few settings where I'm going to default a fill style. So if I fill something up, it's going to be this color, which is white. Very good. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a fill rectangle on my canvas. All right? I'm going to start 0, 0, and then go to the width of the canvas and the height of the canvas. Everything on canvas works on a Cartesian system. It's 0, 0 at the top left. Down is Y. Y going up, right? If you want to go right, that's X going up, okay? So it's all X, Y coordinates. And then I just have a bunch of event listeners and really boring things like that. Now here's our page. Not that one. This one. Now I'm not a web designer. <laughs> As you might tell, I'm looking at this. I am a developer. So what we have here, a bunch of buttons. This white thing is our canvas, all right? Ignore these things at the top right here. The first thing I want to show you is how to clear a canvas. Because in a minute, we're going to have to clear it a lot. Remember, because we're going to be moving things and adding things to it. You know, we're going to be doing stuff like eh, eh, all sorts of fun stuff. But we want to clear this canvas. Ooh, that's yellow. All right. Let's dig into it. So in terms of that, you can clear a canvas one of two ways. Let's say you're dealing with a painting, and you've put something on there, and you let it dry, and you decided you don't want that thing there. You've got two options. Paint it all over, or scrape it off, right? It's pretty much your options. You can actually do the same thing with canvas. In my case, I'm starting with a white background. Every time I hit that clear button, I'm saying fill the rectangle with starting at zero, 0, go to power width or height. Right? Now I have different colors for my canvas or my, for my background just so I can show you this. Now when I clear the canvas, it shines through to the background. By default, your canvas is going to be transparent. Okay? So if you clear the canvas, it's just going to have the background color of whatever happens to be behind it. So, I don't want to do that though. I want to fill. So, does the canvas come with that default one pixel border around it? Good question. Uh, no, actually, I set that to CSS somewhere. I have a CSS file, I set that. It just comes just like a regular element. And as a general rule, you're going to want to set your width and your height in HTML, not in CSS. So, if you set your width, and your height here, and then you change the width and height in CSS, it's actually going to stretch or squish your canvas, which will affect all the drawing inside of it. And so you want to set this in HTML, which was weird for me. It wasted about a few hours of my day once, because I was setting the width and height of your canvas. I'm like, I know I'm not drawing this this size. Why isn't this working? Why is it fuzzy? Well, it's because I was setting it through CSS. Are you so allowed to update it? Have you created it and actually gotten the context on it? Say that again? Are you allowed to update the width and height? Like, for jQuery, can you definitely yeah. change the height? But you have to get the new context, or can you reuse the same? You can reuse the same context. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think resetting the width uh, resets the frame. Yeah. I believe that is the case. It should delete the thing, but you should still be able to use the same context. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one trick for, you know, an easy way to clear the context. It's just, you know, you actually don't even have to change the size of the canvas. You can just set it to its same width and size. <coughs> if I remember right, it will actually clear out the thing. Yeah. I read that was actually like 100 times slower than actually clearing it. What was? Changing the width and height? Changing the width. If you're recreating the entire context from scratch, rather than just clearing it since it already exists. Okay. Good to know? Just heads up. So that's why I always clear the canvas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's start drawing because just clearing a canvas is really good. Let's draw a line. All right. Draw a line. Fundamentals. Let's start here at the top. I've got a lot of just basic examples here. And what we'll do is we'll work through these basics. And then when we get through that, I'm gonna, we'll do a, a coding session where we'll create something from scratch that hopefully will be fun. 
and then I'll show you some samples, uh, mostly of games that I've made uh, or worked on. Um, but one more business case. And I do want to mix a little bit of business in with, with pleasure in this particular case. I mean, there are definitely uses for it in business, but I really, I'm really interested in games. That's really where Canvas shines a lot. Uh, and so we'll spend a lot more time talking about that. But we'll get practical and do business -y boring stuff too. So drawing a line. Remember that, can that context I was talking about? So here at the bottom of that first page when we got our 2D context, I'm passing that in to my other JavaScript files. And so this is coming in here as this little context. And so anytime you see C throughout here, it's the 2D context. I don't spell it out just because, well, just everywhere I put C, I know that's the context. And so just keep that in your brain. This is the 2D context, not the canvas itself, all right? So if you want to draw a line, you say, I want to begin a path. Then I'm going to move somewhere, in this case, 10 x, 10 y. Then I want to draw a line to x350, y 180, give it a width of four. Here's the stroke style, and then stroke, all right? On all elements, at least all that I know of, there is fill and then there's stroke. If you, do, do, just, if you give it a shape and you say fill it, that fills everything but not the outline. If you say stroke, well that will actually draw the outline without filling. Of course you can do both. If you're drawing a line, Doing fill won't do you much good because well, there's no area really to be filled, at least in a plain straight line. So that's what you get if you do what I just did. Okay? Does that make sense? Any questions? Remember the context, the 2D context is your paintbrush, right? And when you draw with the 2D context, you're drawing on your canvas that you took that context from. So they have a certain style, which looks like it's defining actually a certain color. Whereas, like, what about like dashed lines, certain patterns, things like that? Context doesn't provide anything like that because I know a lot of windowing environments provide tools like that too. I've never tried to do like a dashed line or something. Um, it would be relatively easy to write something to do it, oh, yeah. but yeah, but it would still be more work. So I don't know. It's a good question. Any other questions? In terms of style, you also get a little bit more flexibility than just using this. You're actually, and we'll see this here in a second, you get RGBA as well. So you can be a little bit more fancy than just a plain old X color style. Any more questions about drawing lines? No? Okay, good. Because drawing lines are relatively boring. Let's draw a polygon. All right. Drawing a polygon is, well, it's, it's similar. You, once again, you're going to begin a path. Then you're going to move to somewhere, and you're going to line, line, line. So I have three lines. Looks like I have four. Well, I did a fill. And when you do a fill, it has to figure out an area. And so actually, it's going to look like you have four sides. But you actually don't. If we do this again, you can see if we actually do the stroke, you get a line at the top. You know, the first line, second line, third line, but you don't on the last, because I didn't complete it. But the fill will fill it in, but the stroke obviously won't. That is, unless you tell it to. So you have this closed path function that allows you to say, there. This is really convenient if you don't know, from just a mathematical standpoint, how to get to your origin. You can just say, oh, closed path. Yeah, that, that's sometimes very useful. Oh, yeah. um, but if you know where it is, then you can just complete the line and do the same exact thing. And this right here, this line would have been the equivalent of closing the path. <coughs> now, in terms of polygons, these are really good ones to see other fill stuff. So, all right, let's try this again. All right. So I still have the stroke. Can you see that color in there? Not very much. Very, very light. <coughs> yeah, let's, let's make it a little better. Okay. That's better, right? So we have a nice little pink here. This is actually dark pink. But 
I'm using RGBA, which allows you to use decimals to set alpha values. And so colors, as you can see, you can do, do through the normal hex um, way of doing it. Or you can use RGBA, which is something that's, that you can now use in CSS3, at least for browsers that support it. RGBA takes R, red, G, green, B, blue, then A, which is your alpha. And alpha goes from zero to one, where one is completely opaque and zero is completely transparent. And so you can set that value somewhere along the way, and then you get that much transparency. Does that make sense? And if, if you ever, you're going to get weird errors if you ever do this. This has also wasted some of my time before. That, <coughs> that gets you very bad. Yeah, let's do this. This is horrible. <coughs> Purposely causing errors. I don't know. On caught reference, RGBA is not fine. Ah, what's going on? Well, it's treating it like JavaScript when actually you don't. You actually want it to treat it more like CSS and use that same notation. Okay? Now, if alpha values are too boring for you, you can also do gradients. And so we're going to define a gradient. This is going to be a linear gradient. There's two types. And x, y, and then where your color stops are. And we're going to add some, let's see, no, wait a minute. x, y, and then I believe these set the far length of things. This is the zero. I think this starts at this starts at zero and this is where it ends. You add color stops along the way. I want three color stops. I want the first one to start at black and then I want to go to blue and then I want to go to red. And you know blue halfway through, that's the point five. And then one red. So let's see what that looks like. Isn't that pretty? So starting black, going to blue, going to red. There are my color stops. Of course, change that. Where there's very little black, there at the top. No, so little you really can't even see it. All right. So you can do linear gradients. You can also do radial gradients. All right. All sorts of fun stuff. Why would you want to do this? I don't know. I've never, never actually had a need for it, but if you need it, it's there. <laughs> I mean, imagine trying to do that without having a create radial gradient function. So that's how you do gradients, and those are your fill styles. And you can do all sorts of things with that. Now let's talk about drawing a circle. There's a circle. Now, you might not can tell, but does that look round to you? No? Good, because it's not supposed to be round. <laughs> Let's go with black. There you go. Definitely not round. As you can see, this is kind of cut off over here. This is your API for drawing a circle. Okay? And you draw a circle, but you don't actually draw a circle. There's no nice circle function. That'd be kind of cool. Instead, you get an arc function. All right? So what the arc says is this. Where's my centerpiece? X and Y. Okay? What's my radius? There's that. Okay? Now, <coughs> if you think about the circle, let's go over here. Now, this would be a great place for you to have a slide. I never learned, it, who knows what radians are? Okay, good for you. I didn't know that until it was somewhat recently. <laughs> Um, I had a poor math education. Radians are a way of expressing degrees around a circle. Is that a proper way of saying that? So I could say something like here's you know, 90 degrees. <coughs> this can be measured in not only this 90 degree angle, thinking about the center point, but also this is in X amount of radians. This distance right here. Okay? The arc command takes radians. Okay? Not actual, you know, what you would think of in terms of angles. I think in terms of angles, because once again, I have a poor math education. But it takes radians. If you want to, you can do like me and cheat, and then just uh, put in what looks like a percentage of an angle, and then convert it to radians. And so then you just get around its, its actual API. 
But that's how you specify things. And so here's how that works. Here's your xy. Here's your radius. This is your starting point where you start growing. Okay? And by default, it's going to go clockwise. So I'm starting at 40 degrees, specifically, from right here on the right-hand side. I have no idea why they chose the right-hand side. But they did. I'm going to start at 40 degrees from there, which is going to be clockwise, down. And then I'm going to go to 320 degrees. So that's going to take me from here as we go clockwise. <coughs> here. Okay? This means if you want to draw a circle, how far do you have to draw that number? Oh gosh. You also have to start at zero. Yeah. There. Right now we have a nice circle. So that's how you draw curves. And you have the same API for drawing curves, or basically you know, exactly round curves, as you do for drawing circles. If you want to draw a circle, you just draw it all the way around. Make sense? So if we want it halfway there, say I would just say we'd go, let's go, what would that be, 90 there, and then let's see, 360, so that would be what, 270. you got to help me on this, I have very poor math skills. So you get a half circle. Okay? We're going to use this more later. All right. Any questions about drawing? Oh gosh, it started to again. Any questions about drawing circles? No? Okay. All right. Bezier curves. There's two types. I'm going to show you two. This is called a quadratic Bezier curve. I have no idea why it's called quadratic, but I can tell you this. This is how they work. You begin a path, you move to a spot, you do a line. And, um, actually, I don't think I need that particular call there. Yep, no. Then I draw a Bezier curve to another location. Okay? So here's my four inputs. All right? I have a 200 and a 200, and a 30 and a 90. The 30 and the 90, as you can probably guess, is right around here. So what the 200 and the 200 are, this is a control point. This is a drag point. This is dragging the line. And so if I want to do 100, 100, you can see how this will drag the line, not any at all, because that just gives you a right angle. Boring. There you go. So you have now less of a curve. If you want to get ridiculous, of course, you could do like a, it's going to take it way off the screen. There you go. So that's a quadratic Bezier curve. You basically say, all right, you draw, you get to a spot, and then you say, I know where I'm going. Those are your second two arguments. Let's go back here. I know where I'm going. I'm going to 30 and then 90. Now I want to draw, I want to define another point somewhere on the canvas to drag my line, and that's going to cause that typical <coughs> Bezier type curve, okay? Now, there's another type of Bezier curve, and this one is just called, usually, Bezier curve, but this one, at least I mostly see it called quadratic Bezier curve. This one has two control points. So you have your start, and you have your end, and you say, here's control point A, and here's control point B. So. All right, let's see this guy. So I've got a starting point. So let's say we're moving to 10x, 100y, okay? Ultimately, I'm going to go way over here to 400x, 100y. So roughly, I think, exactly horizontal to the other line. But along the way, I want to define two control points. One. See one that gets me um, 100 away from the left, but down 300, so that drags it down. And then 300 away from the left, but all the way up at the top, which drags the line. So if I were to make this negative 50, we're going to see it drag high. 
That makes sense? Cosine curves, quadratic cosine curves. Okay. Sometimes you just want to put an image on your canvas, all right? I've got a regular image on here. It's You don't see it here because it's, it's hidden. But it's there on the page. You can do it, and you'll get that element and then say, okay, draw that image. Right there. And I'm drawing it at 100 x, 0 y. So it's 100 from the left, and it's 0, y, zero pixels from the top, which gives you flat it up against the top and a little over from the left. Make sense? Just draw an image flat in there. If you're going to do games, chances are you're going to be doing this a lot, all right? Canvas is really cool in that you can, you can draw virtually anything on the canvas. But ultimately, if you want to do a lot of high fat, you know, high amounts of, of animation, all right, it's going to be a lot faster usually to actually draw images onto the screen instead of actually draw them each with pixels. You know, let's say you want to draw uh, a guy and he has you know 20 different colors and a lot of different shapes to him. <coughs> you could draw him in canvas all individual columns and draw little circles and draw little squares and color them all. Or you could take a bitmap image and just draw it to the screen. <coughs> it's going to be a lot faster with that. And so what game developers have been doing for a very long time, which is creating bitmap uh, bitmap images of characters and then you know, having different positions of those characters all on that image and just taking pieces and copying to the screen, it's exactly what you still do in Canvas. So in that sense, Canvas is very old school. And I'll show you some examples of that later. Most of my, uh, my game stuff has been done actually drawing images and using what are called sprite maps for making things look like they look very much just like cartoons. All right, so. You can also draw text. Here's your draw text. You can set your font, set your fill style. You can also stroke the text, fill the text. You can use different colors. You can set your line width. And so in this case, we've got a look. So you can draw text on here as well. So you don't have to try to superimpose a div or something like that on your canvas. Yes? What's the best image I've always used JPEGs. I would imagine you could use just about anything that you can probably into an image element on a page, you could probably use. And are you able to bring in a transparent PNG and recolor it? Yes. If you use SVG, you can get red on the graphics on the you can draw higher resolution. That's a good idea. You hear that? Use SVG for a sprite map, you can get higher resolution. That's a good idea. Never actually tried that. <laughs> Any other questions? We're going to see a lot of image drawing in a minute, so we'll get to that. And one of them is going to be a have some transparency to it. I saw you did a get yeah, element. Of I saw you did a get element and you passed like the image to it. What happens if you like get element on a div and pass it to that draw image? Does it attempt to draw what you see in the browser render, or does it fail? I've never tried that. My assumption is it would fail, but later on, if we have time, let's try it. Just to see what happens. My guess is it's going to fail. OK, so that's drawing text. Any questions about that? Those are the absolute basics. These are your basics of drawing. we got a few funky things I want to show, and then we're going to look into a little bit more uh, practical examples. All right? <coughs> OK. Let's talk about transforms. Now, because I have very poor math skills, transforms are often very complex for me. But we'll, I'll do it by this. So first we're going to do is rotating a square. All right? Here's a square. It is slightly rotated down and to the right, as you can see. See that? All right. Let's take this one bit at a time. Okay. So here I'm setting my x and y things are going to be, how, what, how wide and how tall my element's going to be, and how many degrees I'm going to want to uh, rotate this. So if I don't do anything, you know, let's get our boring square. But let's rotate this guy 35 degrees. I actually have to call it rotate. And then it'll work a lot better. There we go. Okay. Now notice something. Let's take this and uh Okay, 
So first I drew a square, right, and then rotated and then drew the next square. So if I were to rotate this, let's say 10 degrees, this is what you get. So as you can see, it's rotating from the top left and it's doing some very interesting things. Now there's something I want to show you about this, which has a lot of ramifications for what you can ultimately do with Canvas. <coughs> in some cases it makes it really hard, in some cases it makes it really cool. What you do whenever you set styles and things, you might have noticed we're setting the style on the context, okay? And in this case, I'm rotating the context, okay? Notice I'm not rotating the square. I'm rotating the context, which means everything I draw after I rotate is going to have that rotated value, okay? I'm setting the fill style on the context, which means once I set that, everything after that, unless I reset it, is going to have that fill style, all right? Now see this context save and context restore. This is very useful. If you need to, whenever you're drawing, quickly need to change something global about fill setting global on the context. And a lot of <laughs> settings are global, like fill styles and like rotations and transforms. But you don't want that to stay that way, and you don't want to have to remember what they were before. You can always do this. You can say, save the state of the context as it is right now, Change anything you want, draw it, call somebody. When you're done, restore the state that puts you where you were before you started messing with them, okay? That can be very useful, as I'm sure you can imagine. So that's what we're doing right here, which means if we now add a third square, all right, now we get this green one. And this green one is now overriding where this other red one was, okay? And since I'm drawing it last, it's drawing over the one that was rotated. But notice, it's not rotated, right? Because I've done a restore on the context. Now, the rotation does things to its positioning for whatever, whenever you start rotating. So, it's a good idea to sometimes translate things. Translate basically says, okay, when I'm drawing, move everything X and Y, okay? So translate, you take two things. Here's your X and here's your Y. So now, after I do my rotation, I actually move my square all the way over to the right sum, and I don't think I use my Y at all. Yeah, this has zero, okay? So you can rotate things, and it's not just squares. You can rotate anything you can draw on the canvas. And you can also translate them. You can also skew them. And this is going to be very commonly used in games. Anybody know why? Look at that shape. If you, anybody done any gaming, like built games? Isometric. <laughs> Isometric views. You can do this in, in, in Canvas. And so the basic idea is, instead of having just plain up and down, here's your squares, right and left, you, sh you, you take the world, and you're like leaning it back some and then twisting it some. And so you get this uh, more of a 3D look, even though you're actually just entirely in, in, in 2D space. You're just squishing and rotating. Here's how you skew things. All right? So I'm doing a little translating, but I'm also scaling things down. All right? So X, Y, so I have my square. Let's take this. It's a... Uh, Take everything off. All right, here's my square. I'm now going to scale it down some. All right, so now it is, in terms of width, in terms of x, it is exactly what it was when you started, but I've made the y half as what it, what it could have been, which made it go half as tall, all right? Now, if I rotate it, I have a nice little isometric triangle except it's off the screen, which is kind of annoying. So I translate it back on to the screen. <coughs> Does that make sense? We'll, use a we'll see a practical example of that here in a second. Now, here's a good business case, all right? Do um, you ever want to take a signature from a web application? Yes. Hey, thank you. <laughs> I just appreciate that. If I, I do have something to give away. 
<laughs> I got that right outside, so. Uh, signature, okay, so I think I clicked on that already. Anyway, so now what I can do is I can go uh, drawing things. Well, that's not much of a signature. Have you ever tried to write your name with a mouse? Okay, there you go. Very poor signature. This is my uh, third grade signature. Now, something you can also do with HTML5 is there's this um, new ability to actually send files over AJAX. Um, I can show you that here in a second. So I'm actually going to save this to a file. Uploaded. Now let me go find it. Yes. Here we go. Canvas Fun Time, that's what I named this because this is Fun Time. Here's my name, Eric. Alright, useful? Oh, yeah. I think so. What so. <coughs> file format you save it to? Uh, in this case, I believe I saved it to JPEG, yes. You can save it to multiple formats. I know you can do PNGs. I don't know what else you can do. So let's take a little look at how all of that works. So I believe that's in fun. It is in fun. Okay. So I have some bits here just to control my mouse movement. And I'll show you when this is over where you can get all this code. So don't take pictures or write it down. Um, this is just for me, you know, handling, you know, handling mouse movement. And when I'm writing, here's the basic idea. If I haven't started, but I'm trying to write right now, begin a path, move to where I'm, current, where, where I'm at, and then set started to true. The next time I come through and I'm still writing, now do a line to where that is, and then stroke the line. Okay? Very simple. And then, ultimately, if I'm not writing, start it false. The way that's done is, when I do a mouse down, write is true. When I do a mouse up, write is false. And then any time I do a mouse move, it's running through this. And then if I'm not writing, it just skips it all. But if I am writing, it goes through this path. And that's uh, literally all you need to do to do that, at least that part. It's too handy. And of course the normal, you know, normal canvas stuff applies. You can change the colors. And whatnot. All right. So if you want to, uh, let's see, do I have this stuff in here? Are you going to have to make all the recapture images? No, but you can totally do that with this. <laughs> I thought about it. How about making my own? You know, go to meme generator, and it's slow, and you're like, ah, oh, this is too slow. And you're like, oh. <laughs> so I think I put my upload, I did put my upload stuff in here. Okay, so here's how I'm saving the canvas, all right? I'm taking the canvas object, one of the few places I'm actually referencing the canvas directly, and I'm turning um, essentially this data that's in the canvas into something addressable, or an image, a, a bucket of, of bits, all right? And then I'm now going to upload this guy. So here's my image data, and there's my alert. That's right, alerts still work in HTML. <coughs> so in terms of uploading, here's how it works. We'll create this new form data. This is not something I created. This is a part of the, the, the form data and XHR improvements that are in HTML5. And I'm appending the file by this name. <coughs> And then I'm adding an event listener for progress, which we don't ever see because it's way too fast. And then I'm opening a connection and then sending the data. Now on the server side, any uh, .NET developers here? Okay, cool. If you're not a C Sharp guy, at this point pretend that this is your language of choice. So it's going to come back with a base 64 encoded string. It's going to have this appended at the very beginning. JPEG because that's what I told it to do when I said image JPEG. So it's going to come with this. All I got to do is I got to take all. I got to get the data. Just take that stuff out. And then I just have the content itself. And now I'm going to turn that from a base 64 encoded string into a file, a, a bunch of bytes. Then I'm going to write the, the file, the bytes to disk. And now I have an image saved to disk. I would assume it's somewhat similar in PHP, Ruby whatever it is that you generally use. And then I pass back a true because that's so helpful. So that's how I save. That's actually how you draw how you can take a signature. 
Now, um, this might work better on a touch device, or using your finger, I would assume so. Uh, or some sort of pen, but you can even do it with a mouse. Right. Can you ask the uh, client to download instead of upload from the camera? Ask the client to download versus upload. Yeah, so if you wanted to save locally on the client. You so could, you just return to the server. Instead of writing to the server, you just return back like a bitmap image with like a downloadable file content. Yeah. I've never actually tried that. All I've done is send it to the server. I've tried reading from disk into Canvas. That I've done. That's also good. Really well. I've never tried to save it on the actual device. So like it's a paint program, and the user doesn't want to upload their work to the server. They just want to download it, you know, save it off on the desktop. I guess you could do exactly what you said. I mean, you uh, ultimately, it's a. I think there's also a, a function from the canvas where you can save it as an image. Um, I've seen it before, but it wasn't uh, when I was working with it. It wasn't implemented in the Android 2.2 browser. But I think it's okay. been implemented since then. Like save the disk. I forget exactly what it's called, but I, I remember seeing it in the HTML spec. There's actually a way to get, when you save something to a data URL, there's actually a way to get to it here in the browser. I don't Does remember the window it. location to it? What's that? Does that? Like window to it? Um, I don't know if you can do that, but you can reference it directly in JavaScript, okay. other than just this. But I don't recall how to do it right now. If nothing else, you could stick it in an actual image tag and then tell the user to write it on it. Yeah. You could definitely do that. Any other questions? Okay. Now, I'm going to show you this one thing. This is something that Mike, Mike right here. Mike works with me. Mike's a nice guy. He wrote this thing where you can actually, it manually draws a Vizier curve, but you can also put text to it. Which is pretty interesting. Um, if you want details, talk to that guy. It'll also be checked in with the source code, but really talk to that guy right there. Now, I will, I'll just show you code for that. Here's your, uh, here's your fun vizier. Okay. Now, I want to do something else, which I think is a lot of fun, and also to show you some of these things up here. All right, here's my controllable fun vizier. All right. I mean, why would you ever want to do this? But you can't, and that's really what matters. You can't. Okay, so now let's talk about some of these. And so, globally, as you're saying, you can change how the context works, right? Your, your pin, you can change globally how it works. You can also change, like, alpha values. But that's one of the things you can do. So I'm going to change my alpha to 0.25. And now I'm going to draw that square. So now the line and everything are now, you know, one quarter of the opacity that they would have been by default. Here's my line, also somewhat faint. See? So I can do that globally. Now, by default, um, Canvas works like a painting, where if you paint something and then you go and paint something else, the second thing you paint is going to be on top of the thing you, that you just painted. That's going to be the default behavior. You can actually change destination over as a setting, which is kind of cool. So I can say draw a polygon. Whoops, that didn't work. Anybody want to guess why? Nope, I guess though. What? We have a field. It's, un it's under the white rectangle. <laughs> to do this effectively, we actually need to really clear it. Because you know, I'm drawing a white rectangle to fill out the whole thing by saying destination over. I'm drawing it under the white rectangle. Uh, actually, I could probably do this by saying, no, I pretty much have to clear it. So let's go back to here. Clear. So let's actually clear a rectangle. Okay, clear. Now, destination over. So if I draw the polygon, I can now draw the circle, but I don't see it because it's below it. Let's see the line. Uh, you see the line sticking up there to the left? Let's start with the line. Oh, yeah, I got to clear first. Nice. And look at that. I uh, skewed the thing. That's pretty funny. Not funny. 
setting that you can make. And then everything after you, if you, after you set that will now draw below what's on the canvas. But then if you set it back, it will start drawing back on top of the canvas as well. And there's a number of other global settings, uh, which I don't particularly want to go into. All right. Any questions on that? Oh, i got to show you this. All right, so we're going to go back to controllable fun vizier. It's my favorite. I totally discovered this on accident. Okay. Watch this. There you go. <laughs> what is that that's rotating my canvas? Something is. Oh, probably because in the update settings, <laughs> I'm messing around here, I have to rotate. Well, that'll do it. Okay, let's go and try this again. All right, so I'm going to set my global alpha to 25%, which means if I were to draw over this, for example, which is actually what I'm doing. It's actually not erasing it completely because every time I draw, it's just 25% opacity. So let's look at the code for that. So let's go to fun because this is a totally fun Azir curve. And let's see, I'm going to save the context and withdraw my curve. I'm then going to restore. At one point, I'm also clearing. Where is that? <coughs> Somebody's trying to find out where they're going. Correct. It's okay. Alright, here it is. Here's my controllable fun vizier. So first what I do is I fill right over it and then I draw my vizier, which means if you know by default, 100 percent alpha, you know, I'm overriding it each time, and so therefore nothing gets left over unless I set this to alpha 25%. And then things are left over. Can you guys see that okay? And it's a cool effect. Perhaps completely useless, but a cool effect nonetheless. What's that? Motion blur. Motion blur, totally. Mm -hmm. See, not completely useless. Or is there a screensaver material right there? It is. Writing a canvas screensaver. <laughs> you should do that and then do a presentation on it. All right. So you can also be businessy. Here's my practical side. If you want to draw, like for example, a bar chart, you can totally do that. Of course, if you're going to do this, you might want to find an open source project, one of the many open source projects that already exist that allow you to draw charts with Canvas. Uh, but this is just me drawing. Well, think about it. All this is is two lines up and then to the right, two draw text and three fill rights. And I have instant bar chart. It's kind of useful. Okay, so now, any questions about any of those fundamentals? Let's build something and see this all put together a little bit. Let's do some animation and get started to think a little bit about games. So any questions before we move on to that? No. Okay, let's do this. This is the fun part. All right, here we go. Here's my playground. Let's go there. Oh, playground. Okay. Now... Here's my canvas. There's a very indistinct line there, which you can't see. Do you want the line? Let's keep the line, at least for now. All right. So let's do something with this. Let's do a little bit of animation. So first of all, you can see here's all that's on the page. I have my canvas tag with a border, I have a width, default height. I gave it an ID. Now I'm going to go find that, and I'm going to draw on it. All right, so let's start with getting the canvas. So first thing we want to do is we want to find the canvas, and we're going to want to get the context. Now, as you know, you probably want to wait until the window is loaded before you try to find the elements, because you want to make sure that they're there. Right. So let's do that. So let's say canvas equals document. Yet I went by ID. Now let's get the context. And that's canvas, get to, let's see, get context, and then you pass in the string 2D. All right? 
Now let's alert the, the context. Let's make sure we got it at least. We have an object of campus rendering context to the. So let's do something with it. Let's do this. I want to draw a circle. So let's go back to um, fundamentals. Let's draw this circle right here. So I like these two lines. All right. Um, this is a uh, smaller canvas than the other. So let's move this to starting place 50 50. Let's start with a radius of 50. And uh, well, let's you know, stick with whatever size it has right there in terms of a starting place and any place. Um, and then let's fill it. Now, we haven't set a style yet, so let's say fill style equals let's see if this works off the bat. Oh, sweet. Alright, there's our semicircle. All right. Let's go uh, zero... 360. All right, so we have a circle. That's fantastic. There you go. You have a game. Not really. So animation. Uh, the old school way of doing animation in the browser was to basically do a set timeout in JavaScript. Where you say, okay, uh, set a timeout, fire it every 16 milliseconds, give you roughly 60 frames per second. That's the basic idea. Uh, we don't want to do that. That's, that's no longer the ideal way of doing it. Um, the ideal way of doing it now is to use something called request animation frame, which is built into your modern browsers. So let's do this. The way request animation frame works is you pass it a function. So we're going to create a function. We're going to call this function. Um, this is going to be our draw loop. All right. So that's what we'll call it. We'll call it draw loop. Right. And so what we want to do is we want to say in here is we actually need to. Oh, let's not do that. A console log draw. All right. And then let's do a document request, no, not document, sorry, window request animation frame. And so what this says is okay, I'm passing you a function, Mr. Window. Whenever you uh, draw next, draw, we'll run this function. Essentially, what you're doing. Whenever you're ready to draw, so let's shrink this a little bit. Let's get our console going and see what we see. Okay. So you can see at this point it drew. All right. It's not very exciting. But you, is it drawing again? Well, it is drawing again, but it doesn't let you know because what you have to do is you have to, in the draw loop, <laughs> call window request animation frame and essentially put yourself in the loop. Okay? There you go. Fun, huh? So it's drawing now a lot. You can see that little number up there increase. Now, whenever it draws, and this ends up being useful, it always passes a parameter for the time. Okay? So, no, don't open the lines. Go here. Okay. So now you get a new line every time it draws. All right. Now here's where this is very handy. Watch this. It stopped. Why? Because this window is no longer drawing. Now it is. Now it's not. Which means if you base something off of a quest animation frame. You don't have stuff going in the background tab. It's actually just going to draw whenever it thinks it needs to draw, which is very handy. And it's also passing this time. So if whatever you have that you're drawing is actually time-based, you can calculate what you need to based on that time and you know put it where it needs to be. If it's not time-based, then you have a much more difficult task ahead of you. But that's how request animation frame works. Okay? So let's do this. So let's let's draw pac -Man. Pac-Man's possible. So let's create a little object here. And I want to give him a um, draw. Alright. Now I want to 
take this drawing code out of here, and I'm going to put it in here. All right. Since my variable is in the global scope, which is of course not generally a good idea, but since my variable is in global scope, I can reference that guy right down here. And now it won't draw because I now have to reference Pac-Man. So Pac-Man draw, and now we should get back exactly where we were before, which is here. Now let's animate this guy. So let's give him a X position. We'll start him off at 50, because that's where he started off with right now. But um, every time he's drawn, every time this you know is called, I want to make this.x plus 3. I'm just going to make him go across the screen. And so this means I need to change this. Now I'm no longer drawing at 50. I'm going to draw where x is. But y, I'm going to see, keep it where it is, and I'm going to keep everything else the same. So now here I am. Not doing anything, probably because I didn't do this. The perennial problem of JavaScript. Now, this, of course, is not, not at all what I want. What do I need to do now? I have to clear. So every time I draw, I'm going to clear, rect, start zero, zero, go to canvas.width, canvas.height, and that'll give me everything. And by the way, if you hadn't noticed, uh, obviously you can change these values, which means if you only want to clear, clear a small part of the screen, you can do that. I'm just going to make it easy and clear everything. So now my circle is going all the way across the screen. And now it left, which is also not what I want. Oh, that's so disappointing. So let's uh, change that, OK? I want it to come back. So if um, this.x is greater than, all right, I want to say canvas dot width minus 50. I want to say, I want to change my direction, right? Which means I need to do this. So I'm going to say direction one, all right? So I'm going to say direction equals negative one. Else, actually, if Else, if this dot x is less than or equal to zero, excuse me, fifty, this dot direction equals one. <coughs> All right, so that's it. What? Well, I'm not finished yet. Oh, vision. Am I? No, I'm not. I need to change this and go to here and say. Now, hopefully, I'll have a circle that goes back and forth on the screen. What's it going to do when it gets down there? OK, sweet. All right. This is so <laughs> slow. <laughs> hey, that's the next one. No, 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 no. OK, so now we're moving a little faster. OK, so now we need enough, right? So if we're going to animate something now, we've got to animate these two values, right? Where you start and where you end. So let's do that. So. First of all, we need to know what the angle, you know, the, the angle is where you want to be both down and up. And it's always the same with Pac-Man because he's, you know, moving his upper and bottom left equally. Unlike us, he's very not human. So let's say, um, let's call it <laughs> lip position. Does he have lips? He doesn't have lips. He's going to have lips right now. So let's start him at zero. And um, let's, let's animate this guy. So every time we, go, every time we, we move, we're going to say, OK, this dot lip position plus one. All right? Now let's take this. Let's say, OK, this dot lip position. And then in this case, it's going to be 360 minus this dot lip position. Okay? Let's see what we get. <coughs> Once it decides to actually reset. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, it disappeared. Oh, boy. <laughs> that's great. Right. Oh, this is not exactly what we wanted. So here's what we're going to do is we're going to now go, dot, let's say I think it would be line to um, this dot x and then you know, 50. 
Let's try this again. Oh, look at that. Yay. Now we're just killing it because you know <laughs> way too hard. Which we, which we don't want to do. So uh, at this point, the numbers are way off. So it's just like, I don't know what to do. I just control some. So, okay, so now we need to figure out not only lift position, but lift direction, and then change that at the right place. So let's do exactly what we did with the normal direction. Let's say lift direction of one. All right. So let's do exactly the same thing. If this dot uh, lip position, let's set a number 40, maybe. If lip position is greater than or equal to 40, all right. Then what we want to do is we want to say this dot lip direction equals negative one. Else, if this dot lip position is less than or equal to zero, this dot lip direction equals one. Which means in theory, we should just now be able to say. That's gonna work. Oh, look That's not nearly fast enough. If you remember Pac Man, he's like, rrr, rrr. okay. <laughs> hey. Now he's, he's eating backwards when you get to this point, so let's, let's change that. So, if his, let's, let's change how we draw this arc. So, if this dot direction. One, we're going right, we'll just stay exactly what we're doing right here, all right? Else, all right, so what do we need to do? There's actually several ways to do this. Let's do this the easy way. And so now, we, you know, let's transpose ourselves to the other side of the circle, okay? So if zero is here, we want to get to 180. That's the center point on this side of the circle. So the easiest way of doing this would animate from 140 to 220, right? I think my math's correct. Am I right? Yeah. Sweet. Okay. So if we're going left, let's take for our bottom half 180 minus this lip position. And now let's do 180 plus this lip position. We could actually do 220 minus the lip position as well. Let me think, is this going to work? You know, you don't really know until you try it, right? Let's see what happens here. That's funny, though. But it's actually almost exactly what we want. Now, remember, it, it, works, it works clockwise, right? So uh, we want to send it the other direction. Uh, watch this. Oh, yeah. True. You look at that code, you're like, I have no idea what that true is for. Um, but I think it'll do what we want, which is we'll now draw it the other way. All right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want you to notice a flaw. What's the flaw here? It's flickering. flickering. Why is it flickering? Anybody want to guess? Draw right. things the same. No, actually. Because when the circle is complete, it's drawing nothing because it's drawing in between the arc here. Exactly. If you do 0 to 360, it will actually draw the circle. If you do 180 to 180, it draws nothing. Mm. Ah, okay, so that, that's probably it. So, okay, probably the best way to do this, the cool way, would be to like use, a, um, you, you, basically using some of the context transposition stuff to move this thing around. Let's do this a little, a little bit better. Let's see. totally cheating. I think this is going to work though. Oh yeah, okay, see that totally worked. And the reason why is it's never animating on the bottom half to 180. It's animating to 170. And of course nobody can actually be able to tell that's actually not going to 180. That's way too small of a, of a difference. And so that's totally cheating, but it works. So now we have a movable pack thing that moves all the way around the screen. So that's basic animation with Canvas. Uh, Canvas is ridiculously fast. It's, it's really actually quite amazing. Let me show you something. Uh, I have this, okay. So this is a little side project I'm still working on. And it involves some of the stuff we've been doing. Like for example, I can, I can actually drag and drop this time, upload the photo. And so I have this uh, anteater here. 
So I'm going to edit the end meter. All right? <laughs> now I want to crop this guy. Let's see. Okay, so I cropped the image right there. All right, so let's do this again. Oh, I don't like you this one. Let's get this guy back here. Okay, edit. Okay. Do you see any flickering? You shouldn't. Every time I move the mouse, all right, what I'm doing is I'm redrawing the image on the canvas and then drawing this translucent square, okay? Canvas is, is ridiculously fast, all right? Um, I, whenever I did this, I expected to have to deal with flicker and stuff like this, because I'm just drawing this image over and over and over. No, it's actually, it's, it's quite up to the task. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. Is it using that underlying hardware acceleration? I would imagine so. And so this does the same thing as the other one. It actually takes the canvas, turns it into an image, and sends it all to the, onto the server. All right, so we have 25 minutes. Let me show you um, a few more game concepts. So we're talking about isometric stuff earlier. This is like an isometric kind of screen. Um, <coughs> let me pull up my page here. This page is actually made up of multiple canvases. It's okay with you, I'm gonna change the zoom level back down a little bit. There's no text to read, so. This is a canvas. This is actually a canvas. This down here is actually just an image, all right? This is what people call a sprite map. If you look at the content here, isometric, Here's my skeleton PNG. I did not make this. I, I found this on the web. Uh, somebody made this in a 3D rendering program. And so this is one image, and it has just a, this character all over this thing, <coughs> in just slightly different positions, which allows you to do like cartoon animation. Just if you want to show him moving, you just quickly move. Paint, 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 over and over. Okay? That's a sprite now. And <coughs> what I'm doing here, in this case, is I'm taking what is a square image right here. Here's, here's the image. It's, it's completely square. I have this other canvas here that I'm putting, I'm basically drawing this image to that canvas skewed, like an isometric, isometric tile, all right? Then I'm taking this canvas as a source and then painting that over and over. That allows me to do the skewing once and then I'm just copying pixels from there to there over and over. Canvas is super fast at copying pixels, all right? You give it images to paint, it's going to do it really fast. If you draw all your stuff, <coughs> well, it just depends on how much stuff you're going to put on there. Uh, but if you can give it JPEGs or whatnot to draw, it's going to be super fast. So in this case, we have a grid, and we have this guy drawn in various places. If you want to later, we can go through this code, and I'll show it to you. Uh, instead, right now, I want to do something else. I want to show you uh, two things that I worked on. And one of these examples is something that you can just get from um, the downloads, which I'll show you, show you later. So let's see, I need to go to presentations. I need to go to 2013. All right. All right, so this is running on Node. You may know JSU. You know it's pretty fun. Okay. You have this at seven six five three. It is All right. So this is a game I've been wanting to build. It's like a combination of Gauntlet and Contra. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, if you're here in the the WebSockets room, I believe I showed you some Contra. So this animation here is all done in Canvas. Mike, raise your hand. Mike did this for me. It's awesome. Um, if you have questions about how to do this, ask him, not me. So this is pretty cool. So this is what I did. 
This uses the same technique. Do you guys remember this guy? Anybody play the old gauntlet on Nintendo? <coughs> Such an awesome game. Anyway, so here's me running around. I can even throw my axe. And this is actually fairly basic canvas. Let me show you just a little bit of this. Um, here's Gatra. Here's our images. So this is what I downloaded off the internet. This is the sprite map sheet for the heroes for Gauntlet, right? I did not go through the trouble of making this. Thankfully, someone else did. Here's my warrior up in the top left-hand corner. And so what I'm doing whenever I'm animating the warrior, okay, is I'm picking out of the image a square. Let's say he's running left, okay? I pick out and I say, draw just this part to the screen. Then draw just this part. Then just draw this part. Then just draw this part. And then start over here. And over. Like I said, it's just like cartoons. And that's what gives me this this look. Right? And the more you know intermediate phases you can have, the smoother the animation is going to look. I mean, you can tell this guy's kind of jumpy, but it's actually not too bad. Especially for Nintendo, right? So I showed you a really simple, you know, drawing. You know, canvas bit for drawing a second ago. Let's let's take a, a quick look at this. It's the same draw image. It just has more overloads to it. So let's say, I believe it's <coughs> user. It's not Andrew who said. Uh, draw. Here he is. Okay, here we go. Draw image. Instead of taking the image and X and Y, it takes, here's the image. Here's where in the image I want to pull from. Okay, so you've got all these different spots. Here's the X of where I want to start pulling from. Here's the Y I want to start pulling from. And this is the size of the chunk out of that image I want to get. Okay, now I want to paint it on my canvas at this location, and I want to paint it this size which means you could actually paint it a different size than you drew from the image. So this is the same draw image method, it just has more to it. Make sense? Yes. So the sprite stuff is built into the Canvas API? Yes. This method is built in the Canvas API. This is, a, thankfully, a use case they thought of. So. Any questions about that? So if you, if does you, the image has to be certain format? The image they are pulling from? Mostly standard formats. JPEG. PNG, those are the ones I've tried. Um, I would imagine whatever the browser can handle, probably Canvas can. But I can't really say that for sure. Does it allow you to specify a mask color? A mask color, I don't know. If you had a green display sheet, was that just display because it was transparent? Oh, or um, no. What I did, mm -hmm. I think in this case, um, you'll probably notice if you looked at the image beside <coughs> I have a, a white version, or actually a, tra a translucent version. Uh, but what you can do is you can get the stuff out, draw it to like a secondary canvas, and then take a color and replace it within there. Because you have ultimately you can, you have access to all the bits whenever you get that in code, and so you can actually replace it on the fly if you want to. So that's how I did it. That was a little easier for me. Yes. So the last thing I think it does have filters like overlay, multiply, and stuff like that. Sweet. Now, I think um, the overlay and stuff like that, I believe that's a part of the, the global canvas context, isn't it? I thought it was the exclusion of the map. Yes. I think you're right. And so what you're going to want to do, usually, on these kind of things is, well, ultimately, it's going to depend on your performance, you know, what you actually need, is if you need to like do some, some prep work for your images, do it on a canvas that isn't even shown on the screen. Do all the modifications you have there, and then just use that as basically just another JPEG to do your drawing. And so if you wanted to use those globals, you could do those globals on this other canvas, and then that's the only one you're globally messing with. When you take the bits off and put them on another canvas, well, those are different contexts, and so the context won't bleed over. So whatever ones you want to do, whether it's alpha or some of the other ones that I haven't ever messed with, like what you guys are talking about. So. How hard is it to draw a canvas? Not hard. Not hard at all. I believe it's in here. Um, OK, 
Okay, so here's my tile renderer. And here's my context for my tile renderer. Okay, so let's find this guy. Okay, so here's me drawing him. Or am I pulling from you? Yeah, here you go. So you take a canvas, turn it to a data URL. Here's my URL. And now I've set the tile in this case is, I believe, an image element. Okay, it's not even image element. I'm actually newing up an image tag, essentially in memory, setting the URL that I've gotten from the canvas. And now I can draw this just like I can draw any normal image. So it's not hard. So yeah. the only way to be doing this stuff is that a separate canvas element, or is there like this concept of a separate frame buffer in memory that you could render to? I think you can. I've never done okay. I think you messed with that, didn't you? Uh, no. <coughs> You can have as many canvases off to the side as you want. I'm thinking of like performance, performance implications of that. I would think having a dedicated frame buffer API would probably be awesome. It might, but in this particular case, I'm drawing this other canvas once, and so but then it's done. Yeah. But maybe so. I've never done it. This is the, the easiest way to do it, at least for me. Any other questions on that? Okay, now let me show you another game. Uh, that I was messing around with. And this is what, um, for those who are not familiar with No Knockout, no, no Knockout is a yearly 48 hour competition where you and three other people get into a room for 48 hours, get all smelly, but you write code and it gets graded at the end of that. And um, I've done it twice now. And both times, of course, we make games because, I mean, if I'm at work, I'll do boring work stuff. <laughs> if I'm doing a contest, not work, then of course I'm not going to do more work stuff. I'm going to make a game. So let's see. Node server. All right. So this is what we made. I think this is last November. Um, there's even seven. Okay, so um, we weren't originally, well, the idea was we we're going to make a fan Final Fantasy Tactics clone. Do you guys ever play Final Fantasy Tactics? 48 hours. 48 hours, yeah, not a full <laughs> clone. Not a full clone, but you know, we, we, it's what we built. And we really did this in 48 hours, okay? Uh, let's get this full screen. So here's me. Um, this Minotaur right here is a sprite map. You see how he's moving slightly? That's just me doing animation. He has this several different modes of just this, you know, sitting here, hanging out mode, all right? And so, um, uh, I was, there's four of us, I was the canvas guy on this thing. We had two guys doing back end, one guy doing the, all the front end stuff and the communication between the back end. Um, all I did was Photoshop and canvas. So, all right, let's get somebody else in here, which ultimately means we're gonna have two songs. I don't have a mute button because when you get 48 hours, you, you've got to drop features. One of them was a mute button. <laughs> so, oh well. Uh, okay. HTTP, localhost. I think it was 3000, wasn't it? Oh, there it is. All right, so now we have a second instance of the music going on. Hold, please, while I go to Twitter. Uh, I happen to have NDD notes. Don't tell them. Wait, I'm an officer. It doesn't matter. Okay. I happen to have their uh, Twitter account. So now I can have two people playing at one time. So here's the, you know, the IE view. And here's the, here's the Chrome view. So, uh, so I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to go. So you get the hit sound, and it does animate, as you can see whenever you're doing your hit. Uh, and of course, this guy's going to try to move away, but then we even have death sounds. All right, so here's how this works. OK. So everything that's up here, outside of this triangle, OK? I'll take the back, I'll show you. Everything that's under this black is canvas, OK? Now, 
everything that's not this triangle, which includes this down here, this down here, which you can't see, but that's just a darker shade of gray. These statues up here, all of this is one large background image that's just painted on the canvas. Okay? Then we have three different tiles, square tiles, that are then turned on another canvas isometrically, okay? Then painted one after another, 10 by 10 grid, so there's 100 squares. All right? So every time it paints, you have 100 paints for the, well, one paint for the background. 100 paints for the squares, then one paint for every dude or diamond, okay? So any dude or diamond is going to be an image that's drawn to the screen. And it, you see these, these images, they're just moving up and down. And they all have a little bit of animation to them. And so my assumption was to get, um, to get more performance out of this, ultimately what I'd have to do, because I was afraid about campus performance, was draw the you know the 100 things into a separate canvas and then draw that once to the screen, but it actually not ended up not being necessary at all. This jumping as you see here is just because the animation is somewhat slow and the sprite doesn't have too many states in it. Uh, it's actually not canvas freaking out. This is actually just the, na the, the nature of the sprite. This ended up being fast enough, and you know when you got 48 hours, features drop. In this case, it was just a performance optimization we didn't need. We just didn't do it. Canvas is freakishly fast. So that's how we made a game. It's, it's WebSocket based. Sign in with your Twitter account. You can play as many people as you want. I think we had, well, ultimately, you can't play more than 33 people at a time because there's only 100 squares. We never tested for that. We didn't assume that that would happen. Um, and so we had, well, it was going on. We had multiple people going on, killing each other at the, at the same time. It was great fun. All that was based on Canvas. And so, it's just using an isometric grid, using the same stuff I showed you, using basic animation, like I showed you, nothing new there. Any questions about that? Yeah. Does it, um, does it scale if you change the size of the window, or is it fixed at a certain width? Um, it will scale if you change it through CSS. And so if we change, if we like did a, a, a set the width of the canvas to like max width, of the window, then I would assume if we were to scale the window, then the canvas would scale. We never tried that. <coughs> and we, whenever we put this out, you know, once again, 48 hours, about an hour before the competition was over, we're like, you know what? We haven't tried this in anything other than Chrome. This could be a complete fail. Uh, we tried it in Firefox, i9, i10, and on my iPad. And it actually worked on all of them. So that was, except for the sound. I had to change something to make the sound work. Um, that was all. All good in that sense. Is that a live chat? It was. Also, website based. So you're saying Canvas is fully supported all the way back to now? Yes. Hmm. Alright, so I'll show you my, my favorite parts of the sounds. <laughs> <laughs> you hear the squishy. <laughs> yes. We recorded those ourselves. We were very pleased. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna play these for you. Here's, here's our sounds. You can guess which one is me. Not really. Based, then SVG would really work well in many situations. 
In this case, it wouldn't. Like, uh, doing all of these as vectors would work, right? But due to the nature of the graphics, I, I don't think I would. Um, but if you're doing things that are going to be a lot less complicated, you know, typically the same thing. Would you save the picture as a JPEG or do you save it as a PNG? It's the same question that you're probably going to want to go ahead and ask. Now, um, I haven't done much with SVG. I've never tried to make a game with SVG, so I can't really comment on that, though. But just in general, how the formats work, um, that would be a distinction I would make. Canvas is clearly made for doing games. I think they really have that in mind, especially with the, with the, the sprite map addition for the image. I mean, why would you use that? Well, perfect example would be games. Of course, you can use other cases, too. You can use sprite maps just in general. But, um, I would think you can make SVG games just fine. No, I think I want to add there. <laughs> I remember uh, Brandon was there and he was saying, I mean, the more in SVG, the more your drawing you do, uh, it keeps redrawing every time. So the performance keeps dropping the more and more you add in the SVG cards and everything you set it up. So it's not meant to be for gaming. So that, that, that's definitely a no. Okay. But you can put a mix mix of uh, this one and you can, because this is a raster image and that's, that's going to be scaling. So you don't want to use that for gaming. At what point is there um, sort of a, at what point does it get so advanced that you might as well use OpenGL or WebGL? I mean, is there, I understand that it's obviously a completely different engine. I know. At what point do you sort of move over? I've never seen Disney's website for the new, the new Oz movie. Yeah. Um, is it completely with WebGL? Have you seen it? I have seen it. I highly recommend it. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Um, we got a little time. It's, <laughs> but it's, it's done completely in WebGL, and it's uh, rendered completely in the browser. It's like Oz. Right. It's for the new Oz movie. I have no idea where to find it again. All I know is that it exists. So not right there. Not it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, let's try to find that later. Yeah, whatever. It's not, yeah. I'm just saying that, that but it's, it's, it's rendered completely in the browser in WebGL. At what point, um, at what point does it become so complex in um, canvas that you might as well need to step up. Well, if you're going to do, um, let's see, what is it? If you're going to do 3D, right, use WebGL as long as it's on the platforms you want to support. Uh, last I heard, Microsoft is still saying, no, we will not do WebGL. That's the last I heard. They don't that's, like that's surprising that Microsoft doesn't want to advance web standards. That's uh, I think in that case, it's <laughs> they say it's a security thing. They're actually doing really well in IE 10 in terms of uh, web standards. But that is one that so far, I mean, they're trying to put direct, something direct X in, right? Um, so if you want to support any form of IE, WebGL is out. But 3D wise, that's going to be the way to go. Uh, I've seen demos of people trying to do 3D engines in Canvas, and it works as long as you don't get too complicated. But it's ultimately going to be limited. And in this case, you know, it may be a case, case by case basis. This right here um, is actually one done by the by Microsoft because they wanted to, to uh, really pimp IE10. I don't have IE10 installed in here. This is in the setup, so I can't show it in that. But this is running in Chrome and it, and it runs great. So let's let's do this. This actually totally blows my mind. This is Canvas, okay? Now I am not this good, so but look at that. That that's Canvas right there. So you, you move the move the ground around and uh, uh. all done in two dimensional canvas. All done in two dimensional canvas, which is ridiculous to me. I mean, um, but you can do that if you are completely freaking awesome. You can do that. I'm not that awesome at canvas yet. I probably have to learn that if I'm going to be that good at canvas. Like I mean, that's just kind of freaky. But is it all that isn't this really complex, uh, just basically easy equation? <laughs> that would be my really assumption. Yeah. I read a blog post on that and some of this. And so, uh, for example, in this scene, there are several small canvases. It's, so, for example, when you move the, the land up, it redraws the land canvas. And then uh, there's a little character canvas. And there's other stuff like the, uh, the light and things falling in the background that are being drawn at different rates. Not everything all the time. So it's 
I'm going to take him to the tree. Look at the grass. See the grass moving? It's ridiculous. So you can do that kind of stuff in Canvas if you if you if you're really hardcore. So um, look for that demo. I'm going to I'm going to check yeah, that. I'm going to I'm, I'm make a Google. Make a Google. Uh, any other questions, thoughts? There's a good shim by Paul Ireland for the request to animate the train. That's actually a good idea. And so if you happen to be in a, in a browser uh, that doesn't support request animation frame, like for example, hold please. You guys seen this set? If you're in HTML5, you've got to use something like this at least. Here's your support. This is caniuse.com. Here's your support for request animation frame. Uh, you've got good desktop support in Chrome, has forever, Firefox for a while, IE10 has it. Um, Safari, if you do a WebKit extension, blah, blah, blah. So if you want to support something wide, a little bit more widely, it's a good idea to use some form of polyfill. And so here's Paul Irish's. And this was written, like, I think in 2012. So he's got lots of things that are, like, crossed out because, you know, new things come out anyway. Uh, if you look in here, he's got his polyfill... Here's a basic instance of it. So basically, if they don't have request animation frame, use WebKit request animation frame. If they don't have that, use Moz. This is now probably unreadable. Okay, here we go. So that's the basic idea. And if ultimately none of those work, return a basically a timer, a set timeout in JavaScript. And so that way, it's at least going to run in in older browsers. But you don't get the benefits of the request animation frame, you know, not calling too much. Thank you for pointing that out. And, uh, maybe the frameworks like the ESOJS and the Sound ESOJS, what's the other one? Uh, ESOJS is a framework that makes it a little bit more like Flash. And Sound.js is just how adds it across the platform sound to your games. But it's also paid for uh, by, my, right. by Microsoft, I think. <coughs> I did a TED talk too. I think his name was D Skinner or something like that. Okay. If you guys are interested in this stuff, check it out. There's some good examples. There was an Oz add on. There you go. Go click yeah. Oz. <laughs> I never click on the ads. So yeah. you just did it. Oz.com. I'm going to go optimize for graphics. Yeah, it's only it's only for you want to make it full screen too. It, it kind of makes it a thing. Makes it a thing. A thing. I want to make it full screen. F F11 or F12 or something. Full screen button. There you go. Look at that. Exit full screen. Hit F11 again. Okay, so so this is WebGL. Completely WebGL. Rendered entirely in the browser. With oh, it's no it's loading. <laughs> I miss loading animations. <laughs> Any other thoughts, questions, ideas? I know a song. You know a song? Sweet. Go ahead. No, no, no. I have a question. Uh, yes. Do you use any libraries? Uh, in this case, no. I'll use jQuery for a little bit. Um, there are a number of open source or closed source, closed source Canvas based gaming libraries, for example, or just Canvas libraries. Uh, because the Canvas API you get in, in JavaScript is a, it's a very low level API. You're just drawing lines and circles and images. Uh, it doesn't have much in the way of, you know, big constructs. You want to draw a bar chart, you have to draw it, rectangles, lines, and everything, right? Which means, you know, in many cases, there's going to be other libraries that are going to make some of that stuff easier for you to do. And so, you can. In this case, it was just all, everything you saw in terms of canvas drawing, except for the funky Bazir thing. Uh, everything was just the plain JavaScript API. Um, should I read that? Did you read? Did you read through these carefully? <laughs> Some kind of human centipede. Just don't worry about it. Just oh, okay. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, mine. Oh, I can't believe you went there. All right. All right. So this is pretty cool. You actually can you actually right. navigate around. Um, uh, wow. 
So this is about where my brain is all over the walls. <laughs> what website is that? It's uh, findyourwaytoauto.com. Let's totally and go there. Your, and it, if you have a webcam, it'll actually use your webcam. Okay, I have a, a webcam. webcam. Let's see. Can you just break my computer? I'm just, oh, by the way, this is my website. I have one of the But I didn't have my eyes too open, so you can't get the retina scan. All right, hey, that's pretty cool. All right, everybody go check that out. It is at find your way to what? Find your way to or to uh, uh, <laughs> 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 way to uh, All right, cool. There's a little bit of this. I mean, shader effects, lighting, shadows, I mean, wind, particle yeah. effects. WebGL is a 3D web, engine, right? It's just, I don't know, man. It just completely didn't grab this. Mm -hmm. Of course, Microsoft doesn't want to do that. I don't know anything about this. Any other things before we, before we end? Okay, now I'm going to show you slide number two. All right. I have two slides. Eventually, I'm going to show you. Who's that? Anybody know? Anybody? What's that? Leonidas. Leonidas. Okay, so thank you. Uh, here's my website. Here's my email. It's me on Twitter. Uh, at the bottom there, is present, uh, that's where all my presentations are. Well, all the ones I remember to upload stuff. I've already uploaded everything there, so it's there now. There's, it's like 2013 underscore the date underscore HTML5 canvas. So you can find, uh, you, you won't find the Minotaur thing, but you'll find Gontra, you'll find all the other samples that we went through there. Please do me a huge favor and go to speaker rate and um, tell me about the talk. I'm going to be subjecting Forward .net user group to the same material here in two months, and so if I did anything ridiculously stupid or offensive, please leave me a note. Um, so I would really appreciate that. That's all I have. So, yeah, thanks. Excellent.